Hi, I'm Jim Smyrniotopoulos, and this week's MedPix video is on subdural hematoma. You can earn AMA Category 1 credit by using the MedPix website. Here is our disclaimer. Let's take a typical case. A 68-year-old man is in a 1968 Ford Gran Torino. He was in a frontal collision two weeks ago. His seat belt was fastened, but in 1968 shoulder belts were not required and neither were airbags. He was walking and talking at the scene of the motor vehicle crash and he refused transport to the hospital. Days later he had progressive headache, lethargy, and some weakness of his right side that has now progressed to significant weakness on both sides. If we look at this pair of axial cross-sectional CT images without contrast, we notice immediately an asymmetry in the size of the cerebral sulci, which appear to be effaced over the patient's left hemisphere. There is also an extra axial collection that is almost isoattenuating to the underlying gray matter. We can see in the dotted line the interface between the extra axial subacute subdural hematoma and the underlying brain. The hematoma is pressing on the brain, but because of the pre-existing enlargement of the subarachnoid space, there is relatively little displacement and shift of the ventricles. When we have subfalsial herniation, the anterior portion of the lateral ventricle and the posterior portion of the lateral ventricle must move medially to pass through the central opening in the fox cerebri. So if we look diagrammatically at three sections from the same patient, we can see how, number one, the sulci are effaced, number two, there is a nearly isoattenuating extraaxial collection, except in the lowest section in the middle cranial fossa, and three, we can also see that there is midline subfalsial herniation. So a subdural hematoma is splitting the arachnoid from the dura. The actual location is therefore under the dura, but over the underlying arachnoid membrane. Subdural hematomas cross the sutures and will wrap around the cerebral hemisphere following the arachnoid as it surrounds the brain. This is a gross picture illustrating a subdural hematoma. Looking down from the top, it is overlying the patient's left hemisphere. In this coronal section, we can see the white membrane of the dura, we can see the arachnoid membrane, and we can see the subdural hematoma between these two layers. Notice that the sulci do not contain any blood. The blood is prevented from entering the sulci by the arachnoid membrane. So what is the source of bleeding into the subdural space? It can be penetrating injury with direct trauma and laceration. It can be pulpifaction from large contusion. But very commonly, it is due to inertial forces from acceleration or deceleration tearing the bridging veins. We can also have blood entering the subdural space from ruptured aneurysms and dural arteriovestulas. But the primary consideration is tearing of bridging veins. So how does this happen? If we look at this 3D reconstruction, looking at the patient from behind, we can see how the bridging veins drain the cerebral hemispheres into the superior sagittal sinus. Classically, sagittal forces are more commonly associated with the formation of a subdural hematoma. In the lateral view, once again, we can see how the bridging veins enter the superior sagittal sinus at a roughly 90 degree angle. Now, if you imagine a glass with ice cubes and you move the glass very rapidly, the movement of the ice cubes lags behind the movement of the glass. And a similar thing happens inside of the head. Normally, the cerebrospinal fluid is supporting the brain and the brain is floating in CSF. So if we look at this diagram here, we imagine the brain is floating in the cerebrospinal fluid and the bridging veins must connect the brain to the superior sagittal sinus. If we move the skull very rapidly, the brain lags behind the movement of the skull and will therefore stretch the bridging veins. We can also imagine that when we have a sagittal force, we may have the skull moving first anteriorly and then posteriorly, stretching the bridging veins in both directions. The bridging veins tear, not where they exit the brain, but where they enter the tough dural reflection that surrounds the superior sagittal sinus. And it's not one vein that bleeds, but it's multiple veins that bleed and on both sides. So subdural hematomas may be bilateral as opposed to epidural hematomas, which are classically unilateral lesions.
If you have greater atrophy, you have more freedom of movement for the brain to move differentially and lag behind the movement of the skull. We end up with this extra axial collection of slowly accumulating venous blood that is under the dura and on top of the arachnoid and layers around the cerebral hemisphere, typically concave to the subdural collections. The last image here illustrates a child. We can see that there is a thin layer of subdural blood overlying the occipital lobe on the patient's left side, and this patient who was under six months of age also suffered from a whiplash injury and a fracture of the C2 vertebral body. In comparing epidural and subdural hematomas, epidurals are biconvex, subdurals are classically concave towards the brain. So remember that when we have a subdural hematoma, the blood is going to be layering around the arachnoid membrane and underneath the dura, and it may even go underneath the occipital lobe and underneath the temporal lobe. Again, the collection is typically concave towards the brain. This has been another MedPix video. Thank you for your kind attention.